three, two, one, zero, zero, and liftoff! Welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Design's podcast on all things branding and digital marketing. Since 2009, Peralta Design has launched hundreds of brands with award-winning identities and websites. Join our hosts Ramon and Jorge as they use decades of combined experience to tackle topics with past clients, industry partners, and the rest of the PD crew. At Peralta Design, we launch brands. But for now, let's launch right into this episode of Mission Control. Hey everybody, welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Design's podcast on everything branding, marketing, and technology. Uh, I'm your host, Ramon Peralta, with Peralta Design, where we launch brands. And today I'm super excited to have uh, probably one of my oldest friends, and I don't mean age-wise, but I, you know, it, I started to get a little bit sad when I started thinking about when I first uh, met Brian and, uh, you know, how the fact is that it's probably coming on almost half my life now that since we first met, it, it took me back, it took me back to 1998, you know, 1999, uh, which sounds like ancient history to many of our, of our young people, but it really is just a testament to the wisdom this man has and, and the experience that he has. So without further ado, let me introduce my good friend, Brian Harneman. Welcome to the show. Hey, Ramon, what's going on? Glad to be here. <laughs> good, man. Good to have you. Good to have you. So we, we first met at Priceline. You know, back then it was, it was this, uh, you know, eccentric uh, millionaire who had this crazy idea that, that uh, there were unsold airline seats uh, and you could name your own price for them. And, and uh, a, to a, a testament to, to, to his genius and to the fortitude of the company is still That's with right. us. Um, what, was, what were you doing there specifically? Uh, how did you even get there? And, uh, and, and just walk me through like up, up till now because you, you, you've done, you, you've, have your, you've had your own startups. You were, I tell some people that you created Kayak and I'm probably completely wrong. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so t- take us through third placer, uh, brand, brand new matter, yeah. you know, brand matter, all that good stuff. You, you, you got it. So the funny thing and a little bit sad was I was actually hired at Walker Digital right before Price yes. That was the company that sort of came up with this idea of commercializing the, uh, the unsold uh, space on airlines. And I was hired as the internet expert. Um, because I had front end design chops, uh, and you know me well enough to know that I am anything but a designer. Um, but this, these were the days of like, you know, HTML 1.0. I had three fonts to work with, I had <laughs> yeah. layout control. And so I started on internet concepts in general for one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did about a hundred patents a year at that point, And then they scaled up to about 300. I'm a named inventor on at least four uh because to be a named inventor you actually have to do a lot of the discovery work not Mm -hmm. the concepting uh but i worked on about 100 patents that first year and the one that they commercialized and i thought was a really interesting idea was this priceline idea um so i joined the commercial team i was the third guy there third person there um and we all worked in one cubicle Uh, we had a database uh we had dba uh we had uh kind of a business analyst and then we had me and um, you know the team grew out from there. Uh, was there ten years? Uh, when I first joined, it was funny. I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. Right? There was all the secrecy around, you know, Priceline. So it was like the, I was working for the CIA. So my friends and my family were convinced that I just went to the park and read the paper for eight hours a day um, because I really couldn't say anything. <laughs> all the paperwork and the NDAs. Um, and uh, so I was there for ten years, and I sort of did all of the online marketing setup, the online ad sales team setup. Um, product development was sort of what we concepted there. Uh, we didn't have a product development process. We just sort of threw shit at the wall and hoped it worked, yeah. um, which was great and it did work, but it was massively inefficient. And we, we got that into a, a sort of a rigorous process that was repeatable. Um, and, and we started building products faster and better. Uh, and then I started buying companies for Priceline. So the one that mattered most, I think, was a company called Lois Fair. Uh, that was an online company in 97, 98, 99 that actually was the biggest uh, seller of airline tickets. It was owned by 
uh, Carl Icahn, the former uh, CEO of PWA. And I bought it from him. And we, for the first time at Priceline, had a retail air site where before we were this weird name your own price uh, player. And we were able to, in a fairly insulated way, test out selling name your own price and retail side to side. Because prior to that, it had been like a religious war amongst the executives of Priceline to try to do retail because it was margin uh, dilutive, right? So we would make 26 bucks for every name your own price air ticket we sold, which is an extraordinarily large amount of money. And for, for retail, you could make like three bucks um, plus a processing fee. And so they didn't want to do that because they thought we would sell more retail, less name your own price, and then overall uh, revenue and, uh, and margin would go down. So we had the sandbox to play in and it worked. And then we bought 10 other sites and then they bought booking. And if you know, you talk yep. about Priceline now, you're not really talking about Priceline.com, the brand, that brand is largely minimal right. uh, to the success of the business. I think they uh, are less than a percent. Yeah. Especially internationally. I mean, it's not known as known there's, as booking. There's nothing international. Yeah, right. I mean, right. Um, they, so, you know, there's interesting stuff. I actually want to talk about that later, but you know, what happens with Priceline in a, in a tough climate, the brand of Priceline, right. uh, booking is now the, the, the real company. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was there when we were selling gas and then we tried selling groceries and, and, uh, you know, trying to license the name. So that's a whole not, we could have a whole podcast. Just about Priceline, I'm, I'm sure. The, the listening uh, audience Large can't, see, can't see me shaking uh, <laughs> in response to your uh, gas and reta uh, retail. Yeah, Gross. yeah. Like I'll, I'll name my own price. I, I'm going to pay five dollars for that T-bone steak, sir. You know. So yeah. So that's a whole nother. I have a ton of interesting <laughs> stories in that business. Um, but so, tell yeah, me, I'm tell me how. Out. How it doesn't sound like you were a travel expert before you got to walk in digital, but did yeah. that did travel like you were just you just earned you know you earned your stripes basically buying these travel companies and and just uh, getting yourself immersed in travel for all those yeah years? yeah specifically on the product development standpoint right because what we did was we actually had to create the case for why we were going to build a product so take rental cars we would actually look at the demand for rental cars for the, for the U S who mm -hmm. are the players. Right. And at, at that point there were, you know, four major players, uh, Alamo, uh, budget Hertz, um, and Avis and, and they've since consolidated, but there, there were enough brands that they would compete against each other within our name your own, own market. Then we had to figure out what we could make as far as a commission play and mm -hmm. then negotiate with them. And then we had to figure out how to sort of project what percentage of our, uh, air volume would take a rental car and what percentage of the overall market we could penetrate and actually incrementalize. So what, what's the revenue that we could get right. for building this product? So that's what we did. And that was the justification that we presented to the board. And then we had to figure out how to market it on our site without, you know, wrecking our site. We don't want people buying a rental car if they're actually going to buy an air ticket. We want them to buy both. Mm -hmm. um, so we came up with these sort of uh, rudimentary, but you know, at that point, kind of interesting ideas where if you had an airline ticket, the minute you transacted that airline ticket, we sent you an email. We call that the bounce back email. And I think you actually worked on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we built a website that didn't interfere with the front end of the website at all, but validated that people actually wanted to buy rental cars from us, uh, which was important as a public company. We had to show people wanted to buy other stuff. Right. Up, which is why we went into retail, you know, uh, groceries and all that stuff. We needed to be a, a horizontal player, not a vertical player, more like eBay than, you know, than, a, than an Expedia. That was our sort of game that we, we needed to play for the public market. But right. ultimately, we validated that, right? We could, we could sell more than one thing. Not everything worked. You weren't always able to trade brand for price uh, in, in some areas. And sometimes it, you were able to do it, but it just didn't matter to the, to the marketplace, right? So if I sell 10 more boxes of cereal, nobody cares at General Mills. If I sell 10 more airline tickets or rental cars, the travel market actually cares a lot. So we had to spool up and we had to become experts in all the, the, uh, the markets that we ran sites in. And one of the first things I did was to actually do a giant canvas of the entire, you know, sort of at that point, uh, web 1.0 of the, of the internet. Uh, for travel. So who was selling? Who were the players? So, you know, what's a GDS? And honestly, in our world at that time, nobody knew anything about how to sell travel. 
Uh, we hired in travel expertise later, you know, guys from the airlines, guys from the hotels, guys from yeah. car companies. But at that point, it was just guys who kind of knew technology, um, you know, and it, it, Stanford was not a hotbed for technology hiring either. Right. Uh, and guys that were generally, you know, really for talented generalists who could sort of play all all positions. And I was I was one of those that, that was able to do that. So now, when I got there, I, I actually come from a print background, and being there is how I got more into doing the banner ads and the yeah. web stuff. But initially, we were doing these newspaper ads where you know it was like William Shatner, and then all the faces of all the people and how much they saved. But at some point, it went from the name your own price into becoming just like every other uh, travel website. So I, I preached this whole differentiator thing to startups and, and Priceline had a differentiator right from the get go, but then that went away. And, and so were you there during that where it just became like a low cost travel option versus the name your own price kind of gaming the system kind of platform? I, I was, and, and the reason it went that way was because we couldn't market against our competitors, right? And, and when I say we couldn't market, it's not that we didn't have a brand that could differentiate. We had a great message, save money, name your own price. But when the market shifted to hotels, right. which was really in 2001-ish, right? Um, we only had a name your own price hotel product. And so if you think about the ways to make money in travel, you sell a $300 airline ticket, you know, and name your own price you could make at that point because we had knifed our service fee, you could still make around 12 bucks. That's kind of cool, right? That's a, that's a nice margin. You could, if you sell a retail air ticket, you're making around, you know, still that $3 fee, right. you know, so, you know, 1% you make on a, on a $300 airline ticket. If you sell a $300 hotel room, you make $60 in margin. Um, for retail. If you sell a $300, it's not likely that you would sell a $300 name your own price uh, hotel room because you were guided down, right? You thought that it was lower and actually the margins were compressed. They were only at about 12%. So the amount of money that our competitors, hotels.com, uh, Expedia, Travelocity could spend was like four times the amount that I could spend. So my bids were much, much smaller. And you know, hotels.com was able to really grab a lot of the market yeah. and I was lagging behind. So we shifted because we needed to from a competitive standpoint. Uh, and frankly, if you look, uh, you know, at the stock price from 2000 to now, I mean, booking is, you know, $84 billion in market yeah. cap. And, and yeah. back then we were barely, a, barely a billion. We yeah. were struggling to stay afloat. So it was the right decision, yeah. but I think you're right that it, um, muddied the waters as far as a standalone yeah. uh, reason to be right now they're just a you know they're an everything player in travel and, and right um, I, I, re I remember using it and, and uh, you know using it getting a room in New York City for example and then getting like a view of like a brick wall or something and realizing like oh, all right I see what's going on here the, the, the price line rooms are like you know, they're just the worst block that the hotel has. You're the elevator. You're the elevator looking into an alley. <laughs> Which was, you know, for some people, though, if you wanted to stay, like, if yeah. you to stay in a four, you know, star hotel room that you wouldn't stay in, right? Right. You, you would normally stay in a two and a half star hotel, which New York was you know, not something anyway. Uh, that was, you know, that was that was a cool experience. You felt like you hit yeah. a lottery, right? Exactly. Um, but it just, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't helpful. And then, you know, what we'll talk about later is, you know, 2001, the yeah. 9 11, SARS in 2008, those events caused hotels to react very differently mm -hmm. um, and caused the uh, online travel agencies to gain an entirely, you know, um, really upsetting amount of leverage over the hotels if you're a hotelier. Yeah. Um, and I think that's going to play out again now. Maybe the hotels are smarter, but we'll talk about that, right? Because when you think about when things happen, when pandemics, when terrorist attacks happen, when uh, credit you know, crunch happens, immediately people pull marketing. And if you're not an online marketer, which in 2001, and really you could argue 2008, um, hoteliers and airlines were not. They were offline brand building marketing, you know, right. big glossy out of home in New York, you know, in Yankee Stadium, right? You, you right. Know, Delta suite. So they spent all this money and it's not money they can sort of pull back from the market very quickly, but they have to cut all their, their marketing spend. So if you cut your print ads and you cut, you know, your radio ads 
and your TV, you're, you're invisible. Done. You're done for a while. Yeah. But if you're priced on in your hotels.com, you can cut your digital spend and then you can simply look at Google to see if people are searching, right? Or, or what's coming to your website. Like, right. and we saw, you know, after 9-11, um, you know, after, you know, 2008, when people were, you know, supposedly afraid to be traveling with good, with undeniably with good reason, we found that they were actually coming to the, to the site and they looked at it as a buying opportunity. Like we know that travel is going to be depressed. I'm going to go name my own price. I'm going to go try to buy the hotel room or right. an airline ticket. And once we saw that, we we're like, let's light it back up. You know, so let's start getting, you know, the demand creation that's already out there. Let's start farming for it. Um, so we actually were able to capture demand and customers way faster than the suppliers. And then, you know, you sort of look at where the suppliers are with, you know, 60% of their demand coming from online channels, right? And their, their, yeah. their brand websites are not nearly what they need to be. It's because they don't know how to market in, right. in those situations. And if they do that again now, they have the ability now to like basically say, we are going to start doing online ads and out market the OTA to sort of try to help climb out from underneath because they're, they're, I mean, they're really under, you know, they're under their thumb. Um, you know, they have the, you know, booking can basically just say, you don't want to, you don't want to spend this amount of money. Great. You're on page two, which is tied for the last place, you know, in, in the online world. And the minute they do that, everybody's demand shifts. And I have other demand that goes to independent properties. And, you know, I, I, I suffer as a, as a, as a hotel in non-core markets. You can be the worst Marriott hotel, in New York and you're still going to be 70% full because it's New York. Right. Right. Uh, I, I want to, I want to make sure I touch on kayak with you. Cause I love the ads. I love the whole logo. I love the thing with the flip with the letters and all and the numbers and all that. Yeah. And, but I remember you were, you had a long commute for some reason that's in my mind that when you were at kayak, you were going somewhere far. I don't know. Yeah. What was that like? How did you end up there? And, and what did you do for them? And, and then, uh, you know, just tell me a little bit about that culture compared to Priceline. So, you know, I left, I left Priceline to, to be the CEO of a company called OpenList, which was sold to a Seattle company. And that was a vertical search and aggregation player. And it did some really cool stuff by looking at reviews on the internet and combining them to make new content, right? So if somebody said this is a good romantic hotel, somebody said this is an inexpensive hotel, somebody said this is a gay and lesbian friendly hotel, and somebody searched for... Can, it, can anybody find me a, ro uh, a, a hotel for Valentine's Day for me and my girlfriend that's cheap? And nobody else had that information. We actually could re recombine the information, slam it up against uh, synonym tables, and publish an, a completely new ad. So OpenList was very cool. And it was also sort of a search engine for hospitality and restaurants. So I ran that. That was in Seattle. And I was going doing the same thing I did for Kayak, which was, you know, on the Monday, I would fly out to the West Coast. I lived there for, um, you know, a week out of the month or two weeks out of the month. And then I'd come back. Um, and then when I joined, when I joined Kayak, it was for strategic uh, business development. So managing AOL deal, Condé Nast deals. And then a lot of the people that I managed actually worked out in Sunnyvale. So I was going, flying into San Francisco on Monday, yep. staying there and then taking the red eye home on, uh, on Thursday or Friday. So uh, yeah, those are, those are, you know, they're great gigs, but they're, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a commute, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah it, know, makes my, it makes my two hours on the Merritt Parkway not look so bad anymore, but. No, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take the two hours, uh, especially when, you know, I, I, I had at kayak, I think I had, I had just had my third kid and I was coaching soccer. Um, so I literally would be jumping out of the, out of the cab, you yeah. know, on Saturday, coaching a soccer game after getting off a red eye. So I'm not going to tell you I was super tolerant uh, when kids <laughs> run the plays. I was <laughs> now, okay, so you know, you're you were in New York City for a bit with with Brand Matter. Yeah. Is it doing similar kind of consulting for? Were you limited to travel, or have you expanded out a bit from travel? Yeah, so let's let's talk about Brand New Matter and, and then third place. So Brand New Matter, uh, Tom and I started you know Tom yeah. Star as well. Uh, in, in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, the idea was to sort of work on stuff that we found interesting, you know, with people that we found sort of engaging and, and, and uh, we thought had a chance to succeed. And the idea behind the, the BNM was let's get sort of paid to do due diligence and learn how to invest in companies, right? So we came up with some 
uh, some frameworks on how to understand goal setting for businesses uh, mm -hmm. and help people align their resources to goals. And the idea was to increase their likelihood of success. Along the way, gain sort of clarity on the plan and then confidence in the team that they can, you know, sort of, uh, you know, execute against the plan or actually help them execute against the plan. And then because we were going to have a small amount of money as a first time fund, sort of punch above our weight because we're way in, you know, with these teams, we know exactly what they're doing. We know who does what, and we have confidence that they can do it. So a little bit of capital early stage with tons of, you know, sort of strategic oversight, you know, our capital is super value added and we have the ability to sort of affect how these organizations grow, which is what BNM did. So BNM is now BNM Ventures. We've got 12 companies. Uh, I'm a part of the management uh, company that sits over at the top. So as those things liquidate, you know, get sold, go public, um, you know, I'll, I'll have a taste of that. And that's, that's great. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I, I think that's. How does, how does third place or fit into this? Is that your own yeah. thing? Yeah. So as they, as we pivoted for uh, the, the VC, we took the advisory services and, and ported that out. And third place or is really the advisory services uh, model that, that we built at Brand New Matter with my own sort of, you know, secret sauce and twist on top. Okay. Uh, and so I'm you know, still working with companies uh, mostly outside of travel. Okay. Uh, B&M for the first two years was heavily uh, levered to travel, but, um, you know, people that we worked with, you know, a lot of the Priceline uh, management team, you know, they have their own, really their own hedge funds at this point, uh, where they're putting money, uh, you know, in early and very late stage uh, investments. And, you know, they'll, they'll come to us and say, hey, you know, can you help out with this? Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's travel, sometimes it's not. And we were, we were always happy to do so. So healthcare, general e-commerce. Um, you know, sort of offline businesses uh, that had factories and, you know, heavy machinery. Um, what we built from a, from a process perspective was kind of agnostic to uh, a vertical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it, the, the one difference is in, in travel, we're the subject matter expert. Everywhere else, we had to very quickly spool up and also make sure that the people that we were working with were, in fact, subject matter experts, because if right. they weren't, that was our first indicator that they were probably going to fail in right. the market. <laughs> so yeah, so I've been uh, I've been doing that for about a year and a half now, and uh, I've had clients in um, uh, app development, uh, health and wellness, um, financial products. Um, you know, so across the board. Well, what's what's one? Give me one success story. We have a lot. Part of this show is to inspire the, the, yeah. the listeners that are like entrepreneurs and they yeah. want to start their own companies and. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, we can, you know, at the end you can share like, uh, how they can reach you. Um, tell me, give us, give us a quick success story of someone you've helped and, and, sure. and how. Sure. And I think that, that you'll remember share 911. We worked together a little yes. bit on that, right? That was so a great concept. It's, it's a tremendously, and for me, it was it's sort of very, uh, perception changing as far as how I want to. Um, you know, sort of run my life and my mm -hmm. career, right? So mm -hmm. Share911 is a, a company that has built a SaaS product for uh, K through 12 schools, yeah. uh, as well as small to mid-sized uh, enterprise businesses. And what it is, it's a platform. It's, uh, you know, on your cell phone, on your desktop computer, um, and on your, you know, your boards and through your, your PA that basically allows anyone that works at a school or a, um, a, a company to signal when they see something going wrong, right? And that could be, you know, a, 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 in, in the worst case, an active shooter, uh, you know, a fight, a slip and fall injury, uh, a disgruntled employee coming back onto the premises, right? You can signal that. The minute I do that, I show everybody in my company, we call it lateral communication, what is going on and more critically where it is. Uh, the big problem that you have uh, for schools is when I call 911, which is what I'm trained to do, that doesn't do anything to help the people that are with me, near right. me, right? So I can call from one classroom and the teacher next to me or the guy in the office next to me doesn't know that I see a guy with a gun in the parking lot. So, you know, in general, they just sort of lock down and wait for help to come. And that can be a, a, a very bad recipe, right? So there's clearly communication issues. It's an inefficiency problem. They solved it elegantly. Um, However, their business was so tilted towards K through 12 that they found it hard to grow. So mm -hmm. they could invest in their business correctly because they had a very uh, 
uh, cyclical way of uh, ingesting revenue, right? So June, July, August is when budget happens for schools. They would get paid out for their contracts. And then it was very hard to sort of grow in the, um, after that, uh, you couldn't really sell uh, into the education market. They kind of make their decision and then they wait. Uh, and because school security is a really upsetting thing to think about, mm-hmm. um, it, it's, it's kind of like an accounting package. Once you have something, you really don't want to mess with it too much. So you don't l- gain or lose business uh, very quickly. Um, when, th- when stuff comes up for bid, you can, you can fight for it. Uh, but it's, it's not something like people are switching, you know, it's not, it's not a SaaS product that you, you, right. you basically turn off and you, you put another one. And on. you guys help them, um, scale or reach more clients yeah. or like, uh, grow yeah. their sales. So, so two things that I think were, were really important. One was this, this reliance on the K through 12 market, which was a gate to growth. So because the, the SME market was really ripe and needed the same product, let's start going after that. So we were able to start for, to move. Uh, the revenue mix, didn't lose any education clients, started to get uh, uh, econ- uh, enterprise clients, which were about 20 times the size um, from a deal perspective of a, uh, of, of a school district. So you're talking, you know, big, big six figure deals, which fundamentally changed the way the business runs. They also, you can farm those all year uh, because it's not the same. There's no budgeting, you know, like a school year. Um, so you can, you can find those guys all year and then look at the way we sort of, uh, marketed. And there was always an issue of people just reaching people, right. You know, you know, getting to the, there's a lot of gatekeepers, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So how many calls could we make as a small team? Not a lot. So I actually found a, a, a call, uh, a calling agency, a cold calling agency. And I, I positioned them at the top of the funnel and then the, the guys who are the closers, the CEO who knows that business and is a thought leader in that area, you know, you get him on the phone after somebody has been warmed up by a cold call uh, firm and, and those, those calls close. So we were able to shift the business from a revenue perspective, you know, open up a whole new market and then get more sales qualified leads without adding a ton of cost to the business. And, um, you know, that business is, is in good shape. Hopefully, you know, the pandemic sort of is understood a little bit more. So the budgeting uh, of school districts, the budgeting office is open and they're able to take yeah. revenue for, for it's, it's uh, kind of sad to say, but there haven't been any school shootings since, uh, you know, everybody, everybody amazing, uh, right? doing distance learning. So, uh, it, it's, it's, we're looking for these silver linings that that one's a, is kind of a sad one, but, um, you know, uh, it, I, I think what you're saying too, is that you're, it's one of those projects that you've worked on that, uh, is rewarding because of the, you know, it's making the world a better place. It's saving lives. A hundred percent. Right. I mean, when I talk about it, I make a joke, which is, you know, before I was taking fat people off the couch and sticking them on the beach. Right. <laughs> now I'm saving people's lives. That's right. a lot different. Right. And it is. At the end of the day, you're like, you're like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a difference here. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and that's important. That's important in any, in anything that you do. Absolutely. I want to get, make sure we get to the travel thing because we did title this the future of travel. Um, it's not the Brian Hardiman show. It, it is that. It is definitely <laughs> that. Um, and I, I want to hear your take because I mean I, I consider you uh, a, a very very smart guy, uh, and and, and I'm, I'm really grateful to have you in my circle. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Because we talked about with, with Rap Tedesco, we talked about restaurants, and many of them yeah. thought they were digital because they had an iPad, you know, <laughs> at the front counter and. Right. For travel, uh, people now are taking road trips. People are still a little bit reluctant to fly, although you're seeing airlines advertise yeah. that they're spraying things down and hotel rooms are saying they're, they're spraying their rooms down with these big disinfecting guns and all this. Yeah. Uh, where do you see this thing going? Uh, because we've got to come out of this. I'm a big proponent of reopening safely. I, I don't yeah. think we can, we can live in a bubble forever. How do we do this and how does that affect travel? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, when we started to think about this, I started to look at what the overall effects had been, you know, at, at a vertical basis, right? So look at an airline, right? So airlines lost like half of their value, literally half of their value, right? So Delta lost $20 billion in market cap. The hotels actually lost, lost a little bit less than that, right? So they lost about a third of their value for Marriott, it's like 10 billion bucks. Uh, and car rentals just got absolutely hammered as did cruises, right? Um, so, you know, somebody filed bankruptcy. I think, uh, I think it was actually budget 
uh, file bankruptcy. Uh, well, Hertz, Hertz gave everybody, yeah, Hertz gave everybody their bonuses and then the stock was at a dollar and then I see everybody trying to buy it and then it's like, you know, just craziness. It's, it's nuts, right? It's nuts. So there's, there's a couple, and then, you know, Uber and Lyft uh, and the sharing economy, you know, sites, with the exception of Airbnb, really got hammered. Um, you know, Uber had weeks where Uber Eats was more, you know, making more revenue for their business than their traditional business, which is crazy. Um, and Airbnb, Uber, and there, I've heard of Uber drivers canceling because they don't want to, you know, New York City, there's protesting going on. Uh, it, it's just it's just a crazy time where where all of this stuff is. We're realizing all of this stuff's interconnected. Our social causes, our our political instability, our our, our diseases, our pandemic, our flying, our purchasing, our interest rates. It's like everything every, everything's relying on each other. Right, right. There's a, there's a really scary Venn diagram of this stuff, right? Um, I, I don't you know I I don't know. Uh, you know, where that shakes out. I, I, and I think anyone who says they know how travel comes back, you know, is at this point sort of, you know, jousting a bit, you know, with, uh, uh, you can't project it, but, but here's what I think. Um, you can start to look at, you know, some of the stats that say we're recovering, right? So one of the easiest things to look at is something called load factor. Load factor is, you know, how many, what, 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 what uh, on the planes, what percentage of the seats on those planes are full? right? And airlines report that. There's also stuff that you can look at, uh, total flyers that go to go through the airports. Um, so year over year, we literally were 95% down for all of April. And it started to, to change around Memorial Day. Right now, we're at like 18% year over year. So we're, we're still 80% down, but it's starting to climb back from that, you know, 95% off, right? It's, 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 it's moving up. So that's around like, we're almost at like half a million daily flyers, which, you know, it was at, you know, 100,000, you know, 200,000 for a long time. Um, so people are starting to, to, to travel. And there's two ways that I think, you know, people are traveling. One is business travelers that just have to go. They have to go. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's going to be a lot of, you know, sort of, you know, leisure, which is the worst term. Uh, trips. But, uh, I don't think if you don't have to go, you're not getting on a plane. Um, so that that goes away. You know, sort of nicety. You know, sort of let's let's go and shake the hands of the client. That that's not going to come back. You know, for you know, twelve to eighteen months. And you know, those things will be affected if if we still find that my sales numbers look good after I don't have to get on a plane and go to, you know, Kalamazoo, I'm not going to get back on a plane. My, and my company's not going to want me to because there's no cost. Plus your wife's used to you being home. So you can't all of a sudden. Well, I think my, my, my wife want, may want me to go to Kalamazoo. It's a whole <laughs> separate thing. Don't you have any business trips, honey? I mean, come on, let's go. I know. I, it's just, are you, are you, we play a game which is called <laughs> let's look at each other in the, in, the, in the kitchen and try to go to the exact same spot in the kitchen. <laughs> At the same time, and <laughs> no, 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 you in second. So, um, yeah, we're we're uh, we're all set. And so, the thing, you mentioned business travel. I just want to throw out there that yeah. you know Scott Case and Jay they went on to start Upside. Yeah. And I'm doing this. I'm in this founders forum uh, that that Scott started. And I thought I use it in my brand new presentation because I think yeah. it's a brilliant way for that they pivoted since nobody's doing business travel he basically said let me create a group where all of my potential clients can can hang out twice a week on zoom so right. uh he's adding a lot of value i really like what they're doing but i'm also concerned and why we're talking about this is like you know are we is it ever going to go is business travel ever going to go back to what it was or or do we find that we can do a lot of what we used to do virtually i think we we find that we can do a lot virtually but then we change the way we I think work changes, right? So if you think about a sales organization that every year had a three week, you know, sales training seminar in, you know, in, uh, you know, in the Cayman Islands, that is not happening anymore. Right. I don't think that happens anymore. But I think that there'll be small groups that mm -hmm. fly to certain areas, you know, maybe they go to the, you know, to New York, and the Northeast team goes to New York together. Mm -hmm. They're very structured, um, meetings highly, you know, like have a, have a pinpoint agenda and they have a lot of ROI attached to them where before maybe they didn't have that. So I think, right. you know, those small group things with, you know, planned, 
uh, meetings and, and events after within a you know one, two, three day uh, agenda, those become more common. Um, and I also think that, you know, as part of that, like the, the New York sales office that had, you know, space, you know, in, in, uh, in downtown, well, we don't need that office anymore, yeah. but we yeah. do need an event space that we can use, you know, four times a year. So I think that type of small event thing, I think that's actually a leading indicator of when things are coming back. And I think yeah. that has to come back first. And I also think, you know, leisure travel, you know, very close in leisure, leisure travel where I want to go somewhere for the weekend. Um, you know, I want to go, uh, to the shore. I want to go, you know, up to the, um, to, to, uh, Massachusetts, that type of trip, road trips, you know, start to become a thing. And there's this weird, um, RV, you know, type thing that's going on where RV demand is through the roof. You know, people really? go all over the, the country. They want to go to, you know, national parks. They want to go to, um, I got a list of places where they want to go. Sounds like a great opportunity for like rediscover America, you know, uh, campaign. I think it is. It's like, you know, see the, see the USA in your Chevrolet type deal. Right? <laughs> I think, and you know, I think that people want to be outdoors and they want to camp. And, yeah. um, you know, if you look at the seventies, there's a lot more people that were camping right. with families in their, you know, in their, uh, uh, not in their RVs, but their, uh, their station wagons. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anymore. I think that, I think that comes back. So, yeah. That's, and that's gas true. prices are low, so people will, will drive more. And right. we, we had a convention. My fraternity had a convention slated for Bermuda um, that got canceled. It was supposed to be in April. And, uh, you know, we had already given them 150 grand deposit, and, and uh, people had registered for this. And we're doing it actually this Saturday. It's going to be done virtually on Zoom. I don't know how this is going to work out, yeah. but it's, it's going to be, you know, several hundred uh, – you know, fraternity brothers register for this thing online versus going to Bermuda. So, right. but, but I think what you, what, what I caught of what you said was that there's going to be a big ROI attached. And I think when we get out of all of this, I think that a lot of fat's going to be trimmed and we're going to be more efficient and we're going to realize, you know, that seven day conference could be done in three and, and our, our, we don't need this many meetings. We can only do it in this. So I think, I'm, I'm an optimist in, our, in, our, in my business and yours as well. We're in the idea business and we've got to always think that this, whatever's coming is going to be better. We've, we've just got to have that kind of outlook. Um, I know that it sucks what's happening, but I, I, do, I do have hope that uh, we're going to learn and things are, we're going to see the silver lining and that we're going to have some more effective processes and, and uh, more ROI on, on these events that we travel to. So, I think um, they're going to have to, right? And, and, yeah. You know, you, you, some things won't be able to be replaced, right? Face-to-face right. -face is a necessary thing for a lot of, you know, business yes. uh, meetings, right? So if you look at the, you know, you know, I'm, you know, a big baseball fan. Yeah. The, the fact that they're trying this sort of union to owner negotiation online is just creating tons of issues. If they were in the same room, they could figure it out. But like, you know, you're talking to me, you can see that I'm looking at you, but if I move, you know, my display over here, I'm talking to you, but now I'm not looking at you and you think that I'm not listening. Right. Like these little social cues right. online you drive people bananas they and do. it makes for suboptimal sort of, um, you know, output, right? So these guys right. are, you know, they're, they're in their fifth turn of how many games are we playing and how, how much is our prorated salary? And they hate each other right now. Right. right? They all want to play games. They just got to figure out how to do it. Right. And it would be way easier to get them all in a room and just let them fight it out I, and come out with it. I agree. I, I agree. I want to I uh, start wrapping up because we, we, uh, we want to keep these things, you know, snackable. Um, yep. But this is great stuff. I, I, really, I really love a lot of what you share uh, and appreciate your insights. And, I, and I'm glad you brought up baseball because I think we've run to each, into each other at Metro North a couple times on our way to Yankee games. So. Right. Uh, I, I, I do hope that they play. So why don't we, uh, why don't you tell us how people can find you? Um, uh, you know, if, if they want to get a consultation, if they want to talk to you about their business, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah. Best way is, uh, is by email. Uh, it's just Brian at third placer. Uh, so it's T H I R D P L A C E R.com. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to, to, to talk with them about what they're building and, you know, how I can help them sort of chart success, uh, and orient, you know, sort of their resources, 
uh, towards, uh, towards the goals that they need to set. And I think one of the things that I've found uh, is it's just really hard as a business leader to think about what comes next. You know, goal setting is not something that, that I'm, you know, really thinking about as a business owner. I'm, I'm just thinking about how to, you know, make the donuts every day. And that means I, you know, get very far off from, you know, many times what I've intended to be, uh, right. you know, as a business and, and thinking about it is, is hard and it's, um, it's a little bit messy, but it's super important, uh, you know, to increase that likelihood of success. So, you know, give me a, give me an email. All right. Awesome. Well, Brian, thank you for being on our show. I, I consider you a friend, a colleague, strategic partner. Uh, we appreciate you being on and sharing your insights. And I think we can definitely have you back on if, if you desire uh, to expand on some of this, um, because we can go in any of these directions and we'll just uh, continue to keep uh, an optimistic outlook for the, for the future of business and, and the future of travel. So thank you for joining us. Everybody out there, thanks for joining us on, on this episode of Mission Control. And until next time, this is Ramon Peralta with Peralta Design and We Launch Brands. Thank you for taking this journey with us. To learn more about Peralta Design and our work, go to www.peraltadesign.com and subscribe to keep up with the crew.